Welcome to our professional development, the economics of globalization. My name is Cherry Han. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm so happy to welcome you today to our webinar. So on the docket, we have what we hope are useful resources and information to help you learn more about how to teach the economics of globalization to your students. Graham Long will share resources and approaches on teaching globalization in the classroom. And afterward, given the importance of the global supply chain and product markets, we'll hear from Gianluca Benino, Head of International Studies in the New York Fed's Monetary Policy Research Div Division. He developed the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index, and this is an important measurement that assesses the intensity of global supply chain disruptions. I find that this will be pretty relevant to all of us because everyone across the economy has been impacted in one way or another by supply chain issues. So Gianluca will give an overview of globalization, the economics of it, and do a deeper dive into this specific measurement that he developed. Finally, I'll speak about this year's high school fit challenge. And especially for those schools who are a part of the New York State's Seal of Civic Readiness Pathways Program, I'll mention how you can use the High School Fit Challenge as a research project to earn a point of the six point requirement for students to earn a civic seal. Even if you know, your school is not part of the Seal of Civics Readiness Pathway Program, the High School Fit Challenge still provides great opportunities um, for you to use as a research project in your classroom with your students. So real quickly, just some housekeeping rules and information before we get started. If you're an attendee, you are in listen only mode and your cameras are off. To access closed captioning, please click on the live captioning bo uh, button on the bottom right of your screen. Now, after both presentations, after Graham and Jean Luca give their presentations, there will be 15 minutes for Q&A for both presenters. Please utilize the Q&A box that's located on the lower uh, corner of your screen. You can type in your questions at any time. <clears throat> no need to wait until the Q&A session begins to ask your question. If either Graham or Jean Luca say both really interesting, intriguing things, and you have a question, please type that in immediately and we will make sure that um, you know, we see your question and that they get asked. The session is also being recorded and it will be available on our professional development webpage in a few weeks. So you can access the recording on our NY Econ Ed professional development webpage in a few weeks after today. Lastly, there will be a survey at the end of this webinar. And in order for you, for those who are interested in receiving uh, 1.5 hours of continuing teacher leadership and education uh, credit, you must complete the survey and email us your contact number for us to call you and process the certificate. So more information about how you'll receive your CTLE credit will be shared at the end of this webinar. Um, I'd like to share the, a blanket disclaimer on behalf of all the speakers, uh, Graham, myself, Gianluca, and that uh, the views expressed are those of the speaker and do not necessarily represent those of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Graham to the virtual stage. All right, thank you so much, Cherry, and uh, good afternoon to everybody joining us. My name is Graham Long, and I'm Associate Director of Economic Education here at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And so what I've been asked to do for the next 20 minutes or so is to sort of set the context a little bit for uh, teaching globalization, as well as uh, really more importantly, I think, provide some resources from throughout the system on how you can teach this particular concept in the classroom. So that's the purpose of this sort of session is where it fits, what are some ways that you can teach it, and then I'll turn it over to a uh, research economist, uh, Gianluca Benino, who will give you some of the content and with a focus on that global supply chain index, the content that you'll then be able to, to hopefully slot into your classroom. So 
Um, that'll be the, the, the strategy that we use today. And so as we go to the next slide, Sherry, if you would, please. Um, you know, kind of uh, appropriate to what we're talking about is this uh, guest essay that just appeared in the New York Times uh, just on October 17th. Globalism failed to deliver the economy we need. And then they, they dive in a little more and talk about globalization. And there, there was kind of one particular quote that I wanted to, to read. Um, fortunately, according to the author, fortunately, the pendulum of the political economy eventually swings back and philosophies that have outlived their usefulness give way to new ones. Seismic shifts in the socioeconomic agenda are rare and transformative. We are going through such a shift now. The world is beginning to reset, not to the normal of conventional neoliberal economic models, but to a new normal. There is a rethink going on in policy circles, business, and academia about what the right balance is between global and local. And so it's a powerful statement just from a couple of days ago, October 17, 2022, and a pretty bold statement, right? Globalism, and, and then they get in, the author gets more into this idea of globalization as it applies to economics more specifically, failed to deliver the economy we need. That's, that's just from a few days ago. So then, Cherry, as we go to the next slide, sort of it's interesting when you start diving into the topic of globalization and you look at these various things. This is from the Dallas Fed, their Southwest Economy. That's their kind of, you know, uh, economics magazine that they, they put out, kind of a digest, if you will, for the third quarter of 2022. when they, they have a, an on-the-record conversation with a professor of economics, and they talk a little bit about globalization, but this sort of conversation Third quarter of 2022 from, uh, you know, the a Dallas Fed Digest talks about globalization remains a force despite the pandemic and political strains. So you have that editorial I just read. Then you have this sort of statement. And then, Cherry, if we go to the next slide, you know, those are two very recent articles, right? And as I was trying to find, you know, some grist for the mills, some conversation starters for our conversation about globalization, I found this headline from the World Economic Forum, globalization is dead, what now? Which you know, doesn't get more kind of you know, blunt than that. But what really made me do the double take was looking at the date, uh, 2016, right? So those other two, you can understand perhaps with the pandemic and with shutdowns and with the global supply chain situation that you're gonna learn about you know, a little later, there has been a lot of conversation about globaliz globalization and successes and its failures and all of those things. So, so the, those headlines to me, and even those contrasting headlines made a lot of sense. And then I found this one from 2016, right? So I think kind of the, the key idea of all of this, just to, to, to frame the conversation a little bit, is that globalization is and always has been a, a complicated topic with a lot of views and opinions all about. Right, and so you as uh, education practitioners, as we go to the next slide, Sherry, please, um, you know, you get into this whole conversation about what globalization even is, right? And so I pulled a bunch of definitions here and you see the one for Nash for, from National Geographic, let's say. So this is the one they use. Describes how trade and technology have made the world into more connected and interdependent place. That, that word interdependent, I think is a, an important one, especially when we talk about supply chains, like we're going to be discussing today. I do like this little nuance too. Globalization also captures in its scope economic and social changes. You see, you, you're going to see a lot of that as well. And so on the next slide, you'll see a definition. Again, I pulled from the World Economic Forum. Globalization is the process by which people and goods move easily across borders. Principally, it's an economic concept, right? And that's what we're focusing on today. But I want to kind of highlight that part where they're mentioning the cultural element as well. As you look at the next slide, the IMF, it's a historical process, the result of human innovation and technological progress, right? They make it seem, the IMF definition makes it seem kind of almost inevitable, right? Increasing integration of economies around the world, goods, services, capital. So this one is kind of narrowly focused on that idea of goods, services, right? Kind of how you might define it traditionally. Um, and then on the next slide, you can even look to see how uh, New Jersey social studies standards defines it. It's the cross-border movement of goods, services, technology, and, but then they start to broaden it out. Information, human 
physical and financial capital. So they, the, you know, the New Jersey standards get a little more broad. And then as we go to the next slide, you can even see, and Sherry talked about this a little bit with the idea of high school fit challenge. Um, this is from our page, which is not so much doesn't provide a definition, but does provide kind of some sort of general organizing statement about integrating markets, movement of goods, and it's that interconnectedness. You see that word again. And so on the next slide, I, the last one I want to show you is the slide. This is from The Economist magazine. And if you go, they have a wonderful glossary of all these economics terms. And I want to highlight this. I'm not reading it, right? I mean, it's, it's very, very long. But what I want to point out to you is how long it is. If you go to The Economist glossary and you look up absolute advantage or, you know, equilibrium price, they're short definitions, right? What you would expect from a glossary. And then I pulled up the one for globalization and look at it. Multiple paragraphs, it's written, they even say buzzword, right? And so the, the, the point of this and the way I kind of want to leave you when we talk about globalization is that it's a very complicated topic to the point where even in the glossary of The Economist magazine, they feel the need to devote one, two, three, four, five different paragraphs talking about it. And when you think about those other definitions, think about all the other things that are tied into it, right? We've talked about the movement of people, the movement of goods. We've talked about cultural aspects. And you begin to see that as well in some of the standards that all of you as education practitioners are going to confront. And so, Cherry, if you go to the next slide for me, please. Talking about this idea of where does it fit in the classroom? right? Kind of where does globalization, how might you talk about it in the classroom? And as you look at it on the next slide, you can see some examples of this. So for example, in New York, they talk about it in a many places. And one of them you see, they talk about it for the environment. So right, not only are you getting this economics piece, but then you're integrating an environmental aspect. You're integrating some science. And then on the next slide, the tools of economic policy. Again, this is a New York state standards the tools of economic policy, global economy, right? So this is fiscal, monetary policy. So if you're teaching about more traditional economic concepts, globalization very clearly has a place. As you go to the next slide, it, again, in New Jersey, they take this, this big approach with growth, labor markets, human rights, the environment, resource allocation. They get into income distribution. They throw in that aspect of culture. You're getting a lot of different subject areas. On the next slide, for Connecticut, right? I'm kind of going through the various, um, you know, states that are part of the second district here. Um, you know, globalization, trends and policies, growth, markets, rights of citizens, the environment, you kind of get the idea, right? And so as you kind of see on the next slide, the disciplines that show up when you talk about globalization are robust and profound. You're getting into economics, you're getting into civics, you're getting into geography, you're getting into history, you're getting into environmental science, you're getting into anthropology culture. You're touching on a lot of key cornerstone issues that students are confronting. And what's great for, for you in the classroom is that these are things that they're likely going to be running into in other classrooms, right? They might be reading a book in English class that is talking about people losing their jobs as a result of you know, offshoring and globalization and jobs moving, right? That's a very real possibility. So you're confronting students who are, are, are swirling around in all of this conversation and debate about globalization. And so that's why it can be both powerful, but also a bit overwhelming because it's like, where do I start? Well, you know, the, when you're talking about, you know, that think about that list of disciplines you just saw. When you're talking about something that includes history and economics and civics and all of these other things, it can be hard to kind of wrap your head around. Those and so what I've tried to do is pull some resources from um, across the system that will allow you to hopefully be able to talk a little bit about some of the uh, topics that you come up with and, and um the, the theme of globalization. And so one thing that I'll go ahead and mention, if you could go back for one second, the one thing that I wanna mention is that all of these can be found at federalreserveeducation.org. So that is the central repository for the Federal Reserve System. All of the various districts that create content will throw their resources into there. And so you can search for these by title, 
You can search for these by resource. You can search by bank. You can do all sorts of filters and things like that. So again, thinking about that list of disciplines, if you're a history teacher, so if you're looking to teach about globalization from a historical perspective, maybe looking back at the 1960s and the 70s, you can search that way. If you want to search from the civics perspective, maybe you're looking at it from human rights, you can filter for civics. So again, that's a very, very powerful tool that you'll have access to is all of these things can be found in federalreserveeducation.org. We'll be able to email you this particular slide deck um, later on, and I'll make sure that all of the links and all of the pictures and everything are clickable links. So you'll be able to jump right to federalreserveeducation.org or any of the resources that I show you today. So now, Cherry, as we go to the next slide, I want to walk you through, again, just a little bit, some food for thought, you know, and, and again, in the, the 10 minutes or so that I have left, just some things to get you started, right? Because Gianluca is going to give you some very, very good content and give you kind of some, some really hardcore economics and looking at the supply chain. But if you're looking for some resources and some ways to make that digestible and accessible to your students, these are some ways to do it. And so I'll start with page one economics. Does international trade create winners and losers? This comes from um, Scott Walla and Anna Essenter, who uh, are at the St. Louis Fed. And so what they've done with this particular, you know, it, it comes from, you know, 2017, 2018. But I think it's still timely trying to get students to understand that that kind of central economics concept of why you would kind of trade at all. Right. Because I think often there might be this idea that trade has to necessarily have a winner and a loser, or that trade is this zero-sum game. And as you start looking at some economic models, the kind of traditional economic view of these things is that mutual trade, you know, benefits all parties, right? That's, that's why nations trade. You open up your textbook, that's what you're going to find. And so what Scott and Anna do is they walk students through that idea. Because you see there in that very first sentence, you know, is trade good? People seem largely divided on the issue, which seems strange, right? Because if all the economic models say that trade is a, is a good thing and benefits everybody, why is there so much contention about it? Maybe your students have those views. And so what this does is it kind of walks students through that concept of what is a winner? What is a loser? How might we define that? And it does it in a very, very accessible way. So if you're looking for something that's that I would say is, is academic, but accessible. Page one economics in general by the St. Louis Fed is fabulous for that. But this particular one, if you're looking for something about trade, is very, very good at breaking it down in a reasonable way. And again, it's, it's academic and formal, but also very, very accessible for your students. So again, that's kind of one option uh, thing out there. The other thing that they have that I really, really like is, and when I was teaching high school social studies, and I taught AP economics for a number of years, uh, I really struggled personally with teaching terms of trade and foreign exchange. For me, that was the, that was the most terrifying thing on the docket, right? It was, to, was, to, was to just something about foreign exchange was just very difficult for, for me to convey. And so what the St. Louis Fed has done is they have something called a yin to trade. And it's a very detailed, I mean, I, I want to say that this book was something like 60 or 70 pages. It is more of a curriculum than a lesson plan. And it walks students through everything from trade to uh, terms of trade to absolute and comparative advantage to then getting the foreign exchange. And you, it does it in a very accessible way. So if you go to the next slide, just to kind of give you some ideas right? You, they do it in a way that is so clever and so good. They're, they're using the tortoise and the hare, talking about, you know, carrots and lettuce. It's a very, very accessible way to get at very, very high level concepts. And what they do a good job of throughout the entire curriculum, if you choose to work your way through most or all of it, and it is modular. So if, if, when you access this, you can easily just pull out lesson eight and use it and integrate it in your classroom without a problem but they scaffold it very well so that you're getting at those basics of comparative advantage, of absolute advantage. You're establishing for students why they might look into trade or things like that. And then as we go to the next slide, they begin kind of building that up. And then eventually um, they get to this concept of why you would use foreign exchange, what the foreign exchange market is. It's a really, it's a really fabulous scaffolded uh, curriculum that I would encourage you to, to peruse. And again, you'll be able to click on the link to get to that. If you're looking for something to hang on your wall so that your students, when you're talking about these things, um, can access them, 
The Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta has a uh, international economics and a trade um, infographic that's fabulous. And it's a full page infographic, you know, taller than I am that you can you can put on the wall. And one of the things that I really like is if we go to the next slide, I had to break it into honestly into thirds. There's a part that I, I can't show you on the screen, but they explain a production possibilities frontier, and then they even get into this idea of output and finding the various things. So for those of you who may be familiar or who may not be familiar, that production possibility frontier represents the outer bound of what is possible to produce in an economy given your existing resources, right? So think of that as kind of the total amount of stuff. In this case, it's um, it looks like it's like, you know, cake or chocolate. Right. And if we allocate all of our resources, like how much cake and how much chocolate can we make? And there's like a, a sliding scale of that. And ultimately, what the bottom of this infographic does is it shows that within the economic theory, the reason that you would specialize in the trade is so that you can consume. Do you see that point? Why? Outside the, the PPF, the economic theory shows you that why it is that nations would specialize and then trade is that it allows you to consume outside of that PPF. So this is, this is something that is probably in your economics textbook or almost certainly in your economics textbook, but sometimes it's good to have it on the wall and you can point to it and you can just remind students, hey, don't forget when we talked about the PPF and the Atlanta Fed always makes it super easy to do that. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Um, I really liked this one. If you're somebody who's looking to tie current events in to this idea of globalization. And there's a lot of conversation about food prices right now, right? And sort of the, the global food industry and with, with conflict where there's wheat and food prices and all of these things. The Kansas City Fed did this article about food prices and global trends. And so what one kind of food for thought that you might wanna do is pull this up, which dates from around 2017, and then have the students go through this, look at the way things were in 2017, and then compare to the way they are now. Better, worse, the same, sort of why, right? And what the other thing that this shows your students is that these conversations have been going on for a while, right? Food prices, global trends, and you know the impact of supply chain on food. Was a, was a topic even back in 2017 when this was made. And you know it was a topic even prior to that too, but this is when the Kansas City Fed kind of put this out, right? So you know, again, just something if you're using kind of a compare and contrast, this is something you can use from the Kansas City Fed to show your students that these conversations about globalization and the impact they have on you have been ongoing. Um, as we go to the next slide. Um, one thing I want to mention as well is uh, the website c3teachers.org, and this will be a clickable link so that you can go to it. They have a number of wonderful inquiries that you can access that, and one of them on the next slide, and we'll go one more just kind of for the sake of time here. Um, this one is free trade worth the price. And so I really like this one. And if you're, in, if you're joining us from New York State, this one was written to New York State Standards. So, you know, right off the bat, you know that you're in the wheelhouse of things that, that the state expects you to be teaching and are in your curriculum. But honestly, having looked at Connecticut and New Jersey and the other, you know, standards, this fits in with you as well. But this does a really, really awesome job of having students kind of weigh that idea of globalization and free trade and how it's impacted. And so it kind of asks this big question about is free trade worth the price and then gets into another number of supporting questions as well, arguments for and against. Right. And, you know, this one sort of goes back to the days of NAFTA, but it's still relevant both as a historical thing and as well as still looking at free trade agreements in general. So I wanted to, to highlight this. This is an external resource that's not from the Federal Reserve Bank, but I did want to mention it because that C3 framework, that idea of inquiry, that idea of asking questions is something that we're really big at with our materials here at the New York Fed. And so I wanted to highlight that because this does an excellent job of asking smaller supporting questions that scaffold up to this idea of the big question, okay? Um, and as we go to the next slide, Cherry, the last thing that I want to, to end with, if we could go one more, um, is just thinking about maybe making economics local. And if we go one more time, the Kansas City Fed, no, if you could go just back one, perfect, thank you. The Kansas City Fed has a wonderful lesson plan about the beige book. 
And if you're not familiar, the Beige Book is the summary of commentary on current economic conditions by the Federal Reserve. It's put out eight times a year, right? The latest one came out literally today at two o'clock, okay? And what it does is it's a, it's a, a, a qualitative kind of summary and review of economic conditions. So it's paragraphs and it's text. And it just describes in kind of very, you know, plain, simple language for a student to be able to, to digest, to understand what, what the economy looks like. And so the reason I want to end with this is all of this talk about globalization and supply chains and all of these things. Because some, of, some things about international trade can be very, very abstract. But one of the cool things as you dive in and maybe think about doing the beige book in the classroom is having students look at economic conditions in their community, asking questions of shop owners, asking questions of their peers, and then being able to link those to global economic conditions is a way to really bring all of these abstract concepts home so that students really understand it. And so I would encourage you, you know, when you get this URL, sort of do a deep dive into this beige book in the classroom by the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. They have, and if you go to the next slide, Jerry, or actually I think maybe two slides, um, if you could skip ahead, just maybe two. Perfect. They have like handouts and sample surveys that you'll be able to go into that you can, your students can model after so that they can learn to ask questions of people in their community to help them understand what's going on in the, both their local economy, and then that helps you make connections with the broader economy as well. And that just makes globalization, it kind of brings all of these abstract concepts really, I think, home and hopefully makes it really kind of, you know, a tangible for students. Okay, and again, there's plenty of more resources. You know, I didn't, I, in the 20 minutes I had, you know, I just wanted to do some highlights. But I think now we're at the point where it's time to get you a little content. It's time for you to hear some, ex some, some experts, give you some discussion, particularly about the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index. And so with that in mind, I am delighted to introduce to all of you, Gianluca Benino. And I have kind of a bio here that I'd like to read. Gianluca Benino is the head of international studies within the Monetary Policy Research Division here at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. He gained his PhD in international macroeconomics from the University of California, Berkeley. He's published extensively on exchange rate economics, international monetary policy cooperation, monetary, macroprudential, and fiscal policies, and more recently on secular stagnation. He's currently on leave from the Department of Economics at the London School of Economics. Prior to joining the London School of Economics, he worked at the Bank of England and has held consulting positions at the Bank of England, IMF, and the Inter-American Development Bank. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Gianluca Benino, who is here to talk about the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index. Gianluca, take it away. Can you, all right, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can okay. hear you. So, so I apologize you. because there are right. some uh, uh, connection issues. So I was uh, a bit uh, uh, delayed. So are you are you managing the slides from your end? So just to make sure because- Yes, so okay. yes, you'll just say next slide and Cherry will be able to do it, but I want you to know we can hear you loud and clear and you're good to go. Okay, well, so thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for allowing me to present. Uh, and uh, I hope, uh, you know, we'll uh, offer some uh, interesting content in terms of one of the dimension of globalization. And uh, let me, of course, emphasize that what I'm going to uh, present and uh, discuss is uh, based on work that we've done internally, but of course, uh, the views are my own and do not represent the views of the Federal Reserve, the FOMC, or the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So let me start with the first slide, which is uh, just a follow-up from what you have 
listen, listen a bit uh, so far. So here I want to focus on one particular aspect of globalization that has been uh, pervasive in terms of the global economy in the past uh, two decades uh, or just less uh, than that. And that uh, aspect is, uh, is related to the interdependence in terms of the production uh, uh, between industries and countries. And uh, one way to label uh, this uh, dimension of globalization has been, uh, you know, it's very, been very popular recently because of the failure that we have observed, but it's been in terms of uh, this global uh, supply chain type of network. And uh, this is an important feature of the uh, world economy that is very different from uh, the old way in which people were thinking, especially about globalization, because uh, uh, old way relies on the uh, thinking in terms of uh, the comparative advantage and the fact that you specialized in the production of one good and you exchange uh, goods across, uh, uh, across countries. So you exchange final goods. But here, the type of uh, specialization, it's at the complex uh, dimension because uh, you exploit the advantage in terms of uh, the input uh, across uh, uh, different countries. So we have this complexity, this production network that is more complex than what happened or what was there 20, um, uh, more than 20 years ago. And this creates a lot of uh, uh, linkages among countries and across industry that, of course, uh, are very uh, delicate and uh, vulnerable, as we have observed uh, recently. So when, for example, uh, COVID uh, took uh, place, unfortunately, uh, more than two years ago, uh, one of the key questions was the extent to which uh, you as a country or industries in different countries are exposed to what happened abroad in terms of foreign lockdown because of these interdependencies that we observe in terms of uh, production linkages. And um, if you go to the next slides, we can um, just try to understand what are the consequences of these uh, interdependencies. And uh, of course, uh, you know, COVID brought uh, some of these uh, uh, challenges is out there for discussion. And the first in terms of, as I said before, in terms of the lockdown, but then also with the recovery as uh, demand shifted towards consumption goods uh, as opposed to uh, services. And uh, as we are all uh, now uh, familiar with, this has brought uh, also inflation in the picture, uh, very differently from the pre-COVID, uh, period. And uh, uh, one of the questions that we were exposed to uh, last year was the, to try to understand what are the sources of inflation. And uh, because of that, we started studying these uh, supply chain linkages uh, more carefully. And we wanted also to try to understand how the lockdown and different type of policy have affected uh, this dimension of the global economy. So the key questions that we were after is how to measure the disruptions that we have observed at the uh, supply chain level. And of course, initially, our focus, as I just mentioned, was more on the macro side, the macro perspective, in terms to uh, analyze the implication of this disruption for inflation, and eventually also for quantities in terms of the ability to deliver exports and to import as uh, countries and uh, are, are, really, are willing to. Now, uh, there is also another important dimension of uh, looking at these uh, uh, supply chain disruptions. And the other dimension is more granular and uh, focus more on what are the implication for uh, different companies that do face uh, indeed uh, these disruptions and uh, face, of course, uh, uh, constraints in terms of the ability to deliver goods, and also eventually these constraints uh, are uh, shown in terms of firm's profitability. So this is another important dimension of uh, the um, work that we're doing, but of course, uh, you know, we initially were motivated more by macro type of considerations. Now, uh, if we move forward to the next slide, I'd like to briefly discuss what we did. 
and why, of course, we did that. As I said, uh, there were these uh, we observed, and there were a lot of uh, popular press that was emphasizing how it was difficult uh, to uh, deliver one good from one country to another or to get the necessary uh, inputs for production uh, from one country to, uh, to another. And uh, we were interested in trying to understand how we can measure all this. And when we were looking at this, we came across with different type of indicators. Uh, and uh, uh, our view was that, of course, so all these indicators are useful and they provide a, a different type of information. But the idea we had was to try to think in terms of how we can collect all this information together. Because of course, from a macro perspective, what we were interested in is uh, to try to exploit this information for our understanding of inflation as I will uh, document uh, later on. And the type of indicators that uh, were used in the analysis of uh, the disruption at the level of the supply chain were basically split in two broad categories. One uh, is the transportation cost I mentioned. And uh, we use indeed those indicators coming from uh, shipping cost and air freight cost. And then the other, category comes from surveys coming from PMIs uh, for uh, different countries. So the idea we had was to try to combine all this information that comes from global level. So we are looking not just at the US economy, we look at the Euro area, the US, the UK, and other countries uh, like Japan, Taiwan, China, and South Korea. And we look at all the indicators coming from uh, this country, and we focus on a particular type of indicators that uh, we thought could capture uh, the disruption that we observe at the supply chain level. So we focus, for example, on delivery times, uh, purchase stocks as a measure of inventories, and backlogs, so capturing the idea that orders are not fulfilled. So those are the kind of indicators that we use from different countries. And we chose countries that are very well connected in the uh, global supply chain that I was describing before. So in the next slide, we'll go a little bit more into the detail of uh, the construction of the index and the, the data. Uh, I want just to say, I'm not going now into the detail of it and I leave the slides for more uh, scrutiny, if you are interested, and those course also will refer to the blogs and the papers that provide more extensive description of the data. But the point here is to try, of course, to get more data as possible. So we try to go as much back in time as possible. And also we try to impute the data that we don't have in order to make the sample homogeneous. Uh, across uh, countries and across different uh, type of data sets. So that's uh, basically the broad idea uh, behind the construction of the index. And uh, as I said, keep in mind, we had this broad, broad uh, uh, distinction between transportation cost and PMIs indicator coming from the manufacturing sector uh, from different countries as a way to capture those, uh, those disruptions. So can uh, we move to the, uh, to the next slide? Now, how do we thought about it? And uh, uh, as I said, we wanted to have one uh, indicator that collect all the information, but also originally the question uh, that we were after was to try to measure this disruption at the level of the uh, supply side. So why we were interested in that? Of course, uh, the motivation for it came from what we were observing in terms of the, some of the policy associated with COVID. So lockdown policy, for example, a policy that prevent factories from operating or limit uh, factories capacity. And uh, of course, also the development of the pandemic where limit was limiting the ability of workers to go back uh, to their job. So the idea was to try to isolate 
uh, this side of the supply chain problem. So this side it comes from from the supply dim supply dimension. So abstracting from demand side. And basically to do that, once we collect all the indicators and we standardize them, then we try to isolate the supply component. And to do that, every indicator that we use, and there are 27 indicators coming from these uh, different uh, sources, uh, we regret on a proxy for demand. And we use the residual in the construction of the index. And the construction on the index is done through a, a relatively straightforward uh, statistical tool or statistical analysis, which is called principal component, that from these uh, indexes that we have derived, extract a common component. And this common component is what we label the global supply chain pressure index. So that's the broad idea behind the construction of the index. So uh, focusing on the supply side uh, problems that arise at the level of this complex production network that I emphasized before. Now, there is a question that I would like to uh, briefly address that I see here, if it is okay, I think I can answer live, right? Is measuring the disruption what stress testing is about, is all about. I mean, here we, we are not uh, measuring, uh, we don't have that ambition uh, to capture uh, stress the test, uh, strictly speaking. But as you will see in a bit, uh, what uh, is interesting is what our uh, index comes with. Uh, how it comes out. And then I will give you a sense of to the extent to which you can relate what we observe from the index to particular uh, stress situation that arise at the level of the supply chain. Now, we haven't thought strictly in terms of uh, this uh, stress uh, testing type of exercise, but of course it could be uh, feasible to use what we are uh, constructing uh, as a way to capture uh, this type of, of level of stress that uh, we can observe at the supply chain dimension. So we move to the next slide. And this is indeed what I'm referring to. As you can see here, we have uh, a snapshot of uh, our indicator uh, from just before the global financial crisis in 2007 and up to almost the most recent observation with some key episodes that are emphasized. So let me first discuss briefly with you what is represented in the graph. So the zero line represents the average historical level of the index, okay? So if the index crosses zero or is at zero, it means that we are at a level which is compatible with the historical average up to that point. Then what we have when we have a plus one or minus one, we have a measure of the standard deviation relative to this historical average. So as you can see, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but when we look at, for example, the pandemic, we see that, you know, going back to the stress question that was asked before, we see that the index jump to levels that are very much higher relatively to what has been observed before. So here we are at level that are above three standard deviation. And these are very huge fluctuations of the index relatively to the historical average. So this means that there is a very big shock. Now, go back to the stress testing point is would be what is the level here that uh, would uh, be associated with stress in the market? That's a good question that we haven't addressed, but I think this is something that would be interesting to push sure. And uh, probably re we need the more analysis in terms of uh, understanding how this level of uh, um, pressures translate into, for example, inflation, if you want to measure stress at that level or in the decline in 
trade if you want to measure stress from that point of view. But that uh, would be an interesting application and an interesting way of using what we are there, what we do. Now, the other question is how do you weigh the different components of the index? So this is another question that came in the chat. You know, the uh, computation of the weights is done by the uh, principal component analysis. So the, basically the principal component analysis is one way in which you combine the different series in order to maximize the way these different indicators explain the information that is contained by the all indicators. So somehow based on the historical, uh, historical correlation among all these series, you assign a weight to all of them so that each gains relative importance uh, compared to the others based on this uh, criterion, which is uh, basically maximizing the information that comes from the combination of uh, uh, the series together. So it's done automatically once you use the principal component analysis. We don't assign the weight in an arbitrary way, but you know, another way would be to use different statistical uh, um, uh, exercise in order to extract information. We chose the principal component analysis. You can choose a dynamic factor model, for example, as another way to uh, you, uh, analyze the information. So what is interesting here to note also looking at this uh, the evolution of the index is that uh, there are fluctuations, uh, but uh, uh, there are fluctuations that are not first as big as what we have observed if, uh, so, uh, during the, the post uh, pandemic case. And those are fluctuations that are very much related to different types of events. So the pandemic is one example. There are other the elements that can affect what we observe at the level of the supply chain. Here we emphasize, for example, the the tension that we could call, uh, let's call that uh, geopolitical type of tension between China and US that uh, resulted in a, a trade conflict. Then climate uh, events are also events that affect, of course, uh, the ability and the capacity of uh, firms to deliver goods or to produce. So that, uh, why that is important? That is important because looking forward, this uh, kind of uh, consideration in terms of supply chain were taken as given in the pre-pandemic, I would say, while uh, the pandemic has uh, somehow uncovered the vulnerability of this uh, complex production structure, the pro production structure that has its uh, virtues, but of course also creates uh, vulnerabilities as we have seen uh, recently. So let's move to the uh, next uh slide i might take maybe the one of the question later now the next slide the focus more on the uh, recent evolution of the indexes i just wanted to show and give you the uh, latest uh data release that we have and uh, that is the august released in uh, actually it's the uh, it's the um, september one that is just released in uh, october and what you can see that is interesting is that we have uh, from the peak that was uh, corresponding basically towards the end of 2021, we have had an improvement overall. Now, this is the evolution of the index as such, the measure the tension uh, at the supply level of the uh, global supply chain uh, dimension. Now, how do we read all this? If you go to the next slide, we see a bit of a more interesting way of thinking about all this. And we do provide these analysis in the blog, but not in the official product page of the New York Fed. And basically in this graph here, we have all the components that, that are used in the index. And what each bar indicates and how each component in the last month has contributed to the movement of the index. So as you can see here, for example, the ARPEX index, which is a cost associated with goods uh, shipment containers, has contributed negatively to the index. So it makes the index go down, 
and this is the test, the value in terms of the standard deviation to in which these components contribute. As why this focus on the different component is interesting, because of course what can happen is that when you read the index as such, you may see a movement, but the movement, for example, in improvement, can be a, a, can have a significant uh, meaning in terms of improvement, so a decline in the index when many of the components goes in the same direction. Of course, if the improvement is uh, driven by one particular component, that might not indicate a general improvement of the index. So we try to understand by doing this decomposition, what is it that is driving the index down? And uh, if you go to the next slides, I'll give you another example that is actually quite interesting. And this is uh, the movement of uh, the different components uh, in terms of contribution in uh, the period going from March to April. Why we focus on that? Because if you go back a couple of slides, you see that the index has actually moved up uh, in that uh, period. So that is this uh, uh, spike that you see in the index just before the uh, trend decline that we have observed more recently. And what happened between March and April? Of course, uh, there was the conflict, uh, the starting of the conflict between uh, Ukraine and Russia. And also, uh, there was a uh, enforcement of uh, the lockdown, zero lockdown, zero COVID lockdown in uh, China. And what is interesting here, indeed, is that we see how that have contributed, in particular, the Chinese delivery time, which is this component here, uh, to a worsening of the um, of the index. And also, there is a, a contribution coming from the euro area backlogs indicator that also contribute to the worsening of the index. So this uh, suggests that uh, somehow also it's a easy or uh, you know this decomposition allow us to pro provide an interpretation of what is driving movement in the index and uh, an interpretation that hopefully is uh, related to developments that we observe and that we can uh, relate to so if you go to the next slide you know the other uh, aspect that i would like to emphasize in the construction of the index is the following is that Going back to the data, and this I didn't discuss much uh, before, but the data are uh, revised. Uh, and uh, of course, when we re the data are revised, we need to revise also our index. And at times, this revision can be significant. And uh, as you can see here, there are some adjustments that occur even further back in the past, because of course, what happens is that when there is a revision today, the historical average adjusts. And that when there is a significant revision, that the historical average adjustment implies also movement in the index that are further back than just the current uh, revision that we uh, are observing. So here we, in this uh, uh, period here, we have seen small revision except in July 2020, in which we consider are more significant movements, but not nothing as you can see from uh, from the graph here that uh, changes the direction so this is important there's nothing that changes the direction or uh, the movements in the index but there are just small uh, adjustment over time so in the next slides on the other end i want to discuss something different something that we have uh, done more recently and it's also i think uh, interesting to look at and uh, we constructed uh, following actually uh, what other uh, have done based on based on our work uh, other institutions and private institutions have developed similar indicators but also they developed uh, indicators in which they did not filter out the demand from the input series that we used as i was describing before and basically we did the same here we constructed the different indicators that we call RO, uh, Global Supply Chain Pressure Index. We call it RO because we didn't filter the demand component. So RO is a preliminary name, if you have a better name 
and it is more it's a welcome suggestion but uh, what we are showing here we are showing how this indicator this red one the row also uh, changes over time and the idea of the row indicator is to capture the imbalances that we observe at the level of the global supply chain now these imbalances of course can come from the demand of the supply side and our original indicator was trying to capture more the supply side dimension. This one, of course, uh, as a mix of the two. Now, why are we using this? And in the next slides, I show and I want to briefly discuss with you how we can use it. And uh, here, of course, the two indicators are different in nature. And uh, we do a very simple exercise here in which we normalize the indicator at the given point, the two indicators at the given point in time. Here we normalize them at the beginning of 2020. So basically the two indicators have the same value in that period. And then we track the evolution over time from there on. And the difference between the two is our proxy for a contribution of the demand dimension to the pressure or to the imbalance that we observe at the level of the supply chain. So let's look at the beginning of the pandemic, this period here. What is interesting is that our indicator, the original indicator, the blue one, suggests that this pressure are very high. But the net imbalance indicator would say that these pressures are not as high. Why? As you can see here, there are this gray bar, and this gray bar, which are the difference between the blue and the red line are our proxy for the demand side of this imbalance. So basically, it is true that there were lockdown and capacity constraint from the production point of view, but at the same time, there was no demand because most of the economies during the period were in lockdown. So there was not much pressure that we observe in net dimension at the level of this global supply chain so indeed there was not much discussion back then in terms of what was happening uh, at the level of the global supply chain but as uh, you know the economy uh, started you know removing the lockdown policy and opening up we see that these uh, problems became more significant and there was no longer any negative contribution of the demand you can see here in the 2021 period and the pressure index increases and the two increases and the increase is actually mainly due to supply factor. Okay, so there was an old period basically up to 2021 in which the worsening of the supply chain problem was mainly caused by supply side uh, factors, at least based on our analysis. And then as the things have improved now, we are seeing bigger and bigger contribution coming from demand. So supply have, uh, factors have moderated, but also demand uh, is contributing to the reduction of the imbalances that we are observing at the supply chain level. So let's move forward. And uh, I move, I go very fast on this uh, because I understand I need to finish at five. Is that correct? Or uh, sorry, I forgot, um, five o'clock. Someone oh, uh, yes, around five, Gianluca, that'd be great. Okay, so let me just uh, uh, say a few words about what else we have done. We have also constructed indicators at the level of the different uh, countries that we uh, look at. So we have indicators for the US, China, Japan, Euro area, South Korea, Taiwan, and United Kingdom. We use basically the same procedure, but of course, uh, these indicators are less. Uh, and they are more volatile. Uh, they're less uh, precise in some ways because, of course, the kind of information that we use is uh, more uh, limited. So rather than 27 series, we now reduce the number of series that we input into our uh, statistical construction. So that, uh, of course, makes uh, everything a little bit more volatile. And in the next uh, few slides, I show how these changes so we see 
that this index has actually improved quite significantly for all the countries now in negative territory. If we go also to the other slides, we see all that. Uh, but also you can see that the movements of all these uh, regional indicators are much more volatile. So you, you see less, uh, you see up and down that are more frequent relatively to the other one that is uh, relatively more stable, if I might say so, because of, of course, using more comprehensive uh, information set. So let me move forward and I want to briefly discuss how we use this indicator. Of course, one dimension is to monitor what we are observing at the level of the supply chain. And this was our original aim. But then, as I said, also we were trying to understand what is the implication of it. And the obvious question when we were looking at it for the first time was to try to understand the extent to which these developments from a global point of view are important in order to address or make sense of what we are observing in terms of inflationary pressure. And um, we did a little bit of analysis on this and uh, we did analysis at different level. So first uh, we did analysis in terms of different measures of inflation. So we look at the producer price inflation, goods price inflation, and consumer price inflation. And also we look also at other factors that could be important for understanding inflation development. So we look at oil price uh, movements in particular. And uh, we look at oil price movement and their decomposition also there in terms of demand and supply forces. Now in the next slide, I'll show a bit how these uh, uh, inflation decomposition uh, is important in uh, capturing what we see or we have seen for uh, inflation at two levels here for US point of view. We have a purchase, uh, so the first one is uh, producer inflation, the first graph, the top one, and the second one is consumer price inflation, so CPI. And this is the decomposition of different factors that we have used in our uh, local projection analysis in order to capture how different factors are important in uh, uh, tracking the uh, movements of inflation. So for example, here we have a producer inflation, the first graph on top, the black line is the movements of producer inflation. So you can see it's here it's very high up to above 15% on a year-to-year -year basis. And these are how our factors explain uh, these um, inflation uh, data. So we have the blue component is the global supply chain pressure index. So the supply side of uh, the imbalances at the level of the global supply chain. Then we have oil demand component, oil supply component, and then of course the what is left is what we are not explaining with our simple statistical model. But you can see here that quite a bit of inflation is actually coming from our uh, global supply chain pressure index. So the idea that this disruption that we have observed at the global supply chain have actually uh, make uh, inflation uh, worsening over time. When it comes to consumer price inflation, still there is a role, but I would say this role is less uh, important. Uh, and as you can see, there are other factors that we are not capturing here that are becoming more and more relevant in order to make sense of uh, consumer price inflation. So let me go to the uh, last slide. So this is a euro area. I'll uh, pass on that and I'll leave uh, for you, but I just want to summarize a bit what we did here. So going back to the topic here, globalization. Globalization, of course, has been analyzed mainly, I would say, from financial point of view and also from trade point of view in a classical way. But in the last two decades, we have seen a different type of globalization in terms of the complexity of the production structure that goes under the label of a global supply chain. 
Now, what we have developed, uh, we try to uh, address and monitor here is a tool for trying to capture how uh, these supply chain uh, are evolving over time. And uh, the original spirit of our index is to try to monitor the disruption from a supply side dimension. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, no one was actually thinking about all this uh, in the pre-pandemic world. And actually, everyone was uh, just taking as granted that uh, you can get what you want uh, when you wanted it. But uh, the pandemic has actually exposed the fragility of uh, this uh, production structure. And at the same time, you know, this fragility is not just uh, can be pandemic related, but as I was trying to emphasize earlier on, there are different types of shocks that can uh, have uh, effects on uh, this production structure and uh, the operations. So geopolitical is one dimension, and I emphasize how the conflict in Ukraine and Russia actually made uh, a worsening of the indicator climate events or cyber attacks that affect the logistic of the supply chain are other possible type of events that can be associated with worsening of these uh, disruptions. Now, how do we use all that? As I said, we use it uh, in terms of understanding how we can think about inflation developments, what are the factors that affect inflation, and of course, that is implication for the conduct of monetary policy. And there are a lot of things we would like to do and we are working on, and uh, you know, hopefully, getting feedback from other people that are interested uh, would be um, uh, good in terms of further developing our work. So I, I stop here and I'm happy to take questions. So in the, the previous slides, there are also the references to the material that I presented. The, there is a, the, the New York Fed now as a blog in which we report all the latest release and explain a bit uh, more about the indicators. There is a paper uh, that is uh, developing more the methodologies, and then there are several blogs that have, uh, you know, uh, presented the, the, some of the material that I have discussed here in this uh, in this presentation. So I want to thank everyone for the for the attention. I think that there are a couple of questions in the uh, in the chat. Um, uh, the one is further along. So let me have a look. If, you, if you'd like, I can I can kind of read it and you can look yeah. at the same time because you did an excellent job of taking them uh, kind of during. So, um, you know, we'll kind of start. This was one that intrigued me was and maybe Cherry, if you could go back in the presentation to the components, you know, the one that had the bar chart with the various components of it. We have somebody asking, looking at the slides showing the breakdown of the various components of the index. It seems yeah. that they're ordered according to size um of the standard deviation and this person is kind of asking like is there a way to show kind of how they've changed over time or maybe if you can talk more generally about how maybe those components have changed over time and if you could go back a little more cherry as well i'll give you a thumbs up when i think we're on the right yeah. side no that is a valid uh, observation yes we do rank the um the different components in terms of the contribution uh, to the to the uh, index and measured in terms of standard deviation, uh, but of course it would be interesting to look at uh, how, for example, they've evolved over time and to keep them uh, at the same point. If I understand the the question, yes, uh, we can do that. Actually, we did. Uh, my colleague of mine and maybe we come out uh, with on a, on a blog recently. Uh, we, next, actually, in the next um, next month after the blackout. Uh, we are, we are planning for a blog in which we do, we wanna look at this question, which is related to the question that uh, is in the chat, which is the following. One other uh, related question is not just to say, okay, what is the, for example, what we can do? And uh, that thing is in the spirit of Jack question, if I may address it, I think by, by name is the following is that, how the different components have played a role in the movement of the index over time, right? So that is something we can do. But another question is that, for example, we are 
after, and uh, probably we, if, we, if we can, we can publish a blog on that, is to see, for example, how Chinese development. So we can also group them by country, no? especially because there is this perception that what has happened in China in terms of lockdown has had quite a bit of uh, an effect on this uh, supply chain. And what we can look at is how, our, uh, the, how we can collect the information that comes from China in terms of explaining the movements of the supply chain. So that is uh, something that um, we can um, we can do, but uh, yes, I think uh, you know. As I said, there is there are, as as we as I said as we have um, uh, get into this uh, as we interact with people, there is always uh, something more interesting that we uh, kind of also discover and think about that we didn't think, and it's all always everything is uh, is very useful. So thanks for for the question. I think. Uh, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, suggestion in terms of what we can do. Um, booming, it appears to see large drop. So this, uh, there is another question uh, by Genevieve. Uh, in 2021, during the uh, peak of the pandemic, there was e-commerce that was booming. It appears we see the large drop between 2020 and 2021 because supply chain were impacted, because of people weren't showing up to work and when people got sick, it must have delayed shipment. Is that correct? So uh, if you go back uh, to, the, uh, to the slides, uh, we have, uh, I actually would like to go in the slide, to, to the slides in which we have what the demand is the supply in the index, the raw index and the GSCPI. Uh, this one actually, yes, let me move here. So in 2020-21, we see uh, the, large, the large drop in terms of uh, the index, eh? you mean? Because actually between, two, ah, here, this period here. Well, here I think part of the improvement that you observe towards the end of 2020, here, I think, uh, is as you can see, uh, there is uh, a big improvement in terms of the supply side. I think uh, one of the improvement uh, that we observe there, so there are two factors that are relevant and that's uh, I want to emphasize, and that is why the raw index is actually useful. So the first one is uh, the reopening of the economies. And I think that's what how we explain this improvement here. So people actually go back to, uh, to work in uh, uh, production, basically at the start, so re renormalization of the economy. At the same time, you see here, when we look at the red one, we don't see big pressure in terms of imbalances. So again, towards the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, there was not much discussion of this issue. And that is also, why, that is also related to the fact that demand was not uh, <coughs> was uh, actually below the historical average. So this is what these gray lines are, are suggesting. So that, <coughs> that is how I would explain this. I mean, uh, and I'm happy to, to maybe expand more if that is not clear. Uh, so that's the way I interpret these movements towards the end of uh, uh, 2020, beginning of 2021, reopening of the economies. So that's, uh, that's what was happening, but in a context in which demand was still a bit constrained. Of sec climate disclosure regulation on supply chain. So have you considering the impact of uh, climate disclosure regulation on a supply chain? No, we did not uh, think uh, in terms of that. So, um, I'm not, uh, so I, I'm actually not familiar uh, to admit uh, with that uh, disclosure. So, and see how that could, uh, how we can, we can relate it to that. But thanks, I think that is an interesting observation. As I said before, there are different uh, um, type of um, issues, uh, let me call it in this way, and climate is uh, another one that can affect uh, these developments. The way I thought about it uh, was in terms of what I call shocks. So I think about the pandemic 
think as a shock. I think about geopolitical events as shocks. I think about cyber attacks as shocks. I think about climate events as shocks. But the question, I think it's a very interesting question because also suggests that there are possible other dimensions that can be important, like in terms of regulation. And that I, I, I am not familiar, but I think it's actually a very good point in terms of thinking about how regulation can have an impact in terms of what we observe at the level of supply chain or climate type of policy, of course, are very important because one of the, you know, some of these issues are strictly related to shipment uh, and, uh, and and so on. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a very important uh, point. Gianluca, thank you so much for this presentation. I personally learned a lot and I have a greater appreciation for your work and um, just what all the research economists do. I learned, I hope they, um, and I saw that the audience had amazing questions as well. So thank you again, just for well, sharing your, your content um, and just what you've been working on. It really does make a, an impact on um, just this new tool that we have to learn about globalization. So well, thank you. Th thank you very much. And of course, uh, uh, you know, feel free to reach us. Uh, we have uh, public emails and, uh, you know, there is also the product page. And uh, if you can help and uh, clarify uh, the content or uh, provide more information, or if you have suggestions, of course, those are more than welcome. Uh, and thank you for your attention and uh, feedback. Really uh, very interesting. Thank you. Um, so, hi everybody. Um, I'm going to segue into the last section of this webinar, and that is <clears throat> the High School Fed Challenge 2022 to 2023. I'll walk you through just some of the brief background of um, the High School Fed Challenge, as well as how it aligns to what I alluded to earlier regarding the civics, the seal of civic readiness research project. And so, Brief background for those who may not be familiar with our High School Fed Challenge academic competition. It's an academic competition designed to really pique students' interest in economics and public policy. So this year, our theme is economics of globalization. And students can pick any topic under that umbrella theme. And by allowing them to choose any subtopic, we hope that they would gain a sense of ownership in when they write research and when they write their podcast transcripts. And as they conduct their research and their writing with their other teammates, we hope that this would really uh, motivate and, and pique students' curiosity about future careers in economics and public policy. So that's just brief background of what our High School Fit Challenge academic competition is. Now, this is something new um, regarding how the High School Fed Challenge aligns to the Seal of Civic Readiness Research Project. So really briefly, the Seal of Civic Readiness is a new initiative supported by the New York State Department of Education. And in order to earn a civic seal, students have to have a total of six points through schoolwork or activities that demonstrate their knowledge of civics and civic engagement. It benefits students because at the end, once they obtain a seal, it's literally a seal on their transcript and diploma. And it's like a statement for future employers and for college admissions. And so this is just a brief background. And for those, for, for you here who may not be familiar with uh, this civic readiness pathway, um, I still believe that what I'm about to share is still relevant because the High School Fit Challenge can be used as a research project um, in your classrooms, whether or not you're part of the Seal of Civic Readiness Pathway Program. But what you see in front of you are the four criteria regarding the research project for students to earn that one point um, towards their Seal of Civic Readiness. It requires students to examine a question, political question, historical, government question through the civics lens. It also requires students to use various resources as they investigate their thesis and their research question. Um, students are supposed to evaluate their question and how it impacts today and their communities. 
And finally, they have different options to submit their research project in either written, audio, or visual format. So what I'm going to do on the next few slides is show exactly how the High School Fit Challenge aligns with the criteria for the Seal of Civic Readiness Research Project. So the first um, criteria, examine a question through the lens of civics. The High School Fit Challenge requires students to examine a compelling economics concept or a question that has an influence on public policy. So just for some examples I want to provide you, we've received a lot of interesting submissions in the past two years. And some of these include the gender wage gap, gentrification, redlining, and this year, uh, climate change's impact on small farms, the cost of tourism, impact of fast fashion on our climate. This year's theme, again, the economics of globalization allows students to examine and select such a wide range of topics. The second criteria, you know, use a variety of resources uh, to fully investigate the research question. Well, that also is our criteria for the high school fit challenge in our rubric, which you can find in our uh, rule, book, rule book on our website, requires students to utilize a variety of data sources. Even though the format is still a written podcast transcript, we require the students to have uh, in-text citations. We want students to be able to reference their sources. And we also require students to submit either a bibliography or a works cited page um, along with their podcast transcript. The third criteria, evaluate the impact of the topic on the past and its connection to the present day. It aligns directly with our criteria for uh, H excuse me, HSFC. We want students to really examine um, their economics concept that they chose under the theme of the economics of globalization and how it impacts their communities or society at large. Our submissions really encourage students to think of such a compelling concept and to do some rigorous research to back up their thesis or to answer their question. Lastly, present uh, the criteria for the research project ask students to present their research in either written, audiovisual, oral, or oral or multimodal formats. We um, can only accept uh, the transcript as a written format and, and as a PDF file. Um, but as an extension activity, teachers, if you're interested, you can encourage your students to record their transcripts as an audio format. Um, and that might excite and encourage students to uh, embark on this research project. But we, uh, when you submit, will only accept it as a written podcast script. Now, selected scripts will be published in our Journal of Future Economists, which you can access right now on our website. You can also order um, for free on our website as well. So all uh, selected submissions will be published in our third volume of the Journal of Future Economists. So briefly, here is a compact chart of again, how the High School Fed Challenge aligns with the criteria for the Seal of Civic Readiness Research Project. Um, again, even if, you, if your school is not part of that Seal of Civic Readiness Research or Pathway Program, you can still utilize and propose doing the High School Fit Challenge in your classrooms as an extended research project. So Resource Center for this year's theme, Economics of Globalization, it's on our website. And we've curated several resources that we think might be helpful for you and your students to get started. So many of them come from uh, our reserve banks. We just heard from Gianluca about the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index. That's one resource you can use. The Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas has a whole section on their webpage dedicated to globalization called the Globalization Institute. And the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis also has an extensive section on trade and globalization. We also, you can see at the bottom of the list, various NGOs, research institutions that will provide a plethora of data articles, research, and publications on globalization. Now, you don't have to use these resources, uh, but these are just 
some places to get started. And I'll just I'll go through quickly important dates and reminders. The registration deadline is in four months. So you have until February 15th to register. Um, the submission deadline is a month after our registration deadline, but if you've already registered, you still have some time to submit your podcast transcript to us. And the submission deadline is March 15th, 2023. Now we'll notify all the schools who have submitted their transcripts whether or not they've been selected to be published in the journal by May 15th. Okay, so May 15th is when the schools, the teams will know whether or not uh, their transcripts have been selected to be published. Um, just a quick, just some quick reminders. A lot of our information, and we'll send this slide deck out um, with clickable links as Graham had mentioned before, can be found on our High School Fit Challenge webpage. So when you register, just a reminder to make sure you also submit your principal acknowledgement forms and also to look at the rule book. It has been updated for this year. The rule book contains the rubric and guidelines for how to submit your team's research paper and what format it should be, all that good stuff. At this time, if you have any questions, I'll be so happy to take them. Um, if not, no worries. And you can also email me individually as well if you have additional questions about the High School Fed Challenge program. Okay, so if there are no questions, oh, thank well, thank you so much. Yes. Is there a limit to how many students can participate? Yes, so a team. Can, has to be a minimum of three students and no more than eight. And it, it can only be one team per school. And then I'll see if there are any more coming, trickling in. All right, feel, feel free, if, you, if any more questions uh, come up, feel free to keep them coming in the uh, Q&A box. I just want to remind everyone Regarding receiving CTLE credit, um, you will have to complete a five question survey, which will pop up in Zoom. Once you complete that, you'll email us at nyeconet at ny.frb.org that you've completed um, the survey. And also, please let us know your contact information, the best way to, your best um, phone number to reach you at, because the way that we have to process these CTLE certificates is we have to uh, put in your date of birth and the last four digits of your social. We don't want that coming in via email. So a t one of our team members will reach out to you at the number you uh, email us, and we will get that information to process your CTLE certificates. It will come via a secured email. So when it does come, or when we do send them out, please check your spam or junk folder. And I have one more question. Oh, so the link to the survey will pop up shortly after I uh, close my presentation. Thank you for that question. All right, if uh, there are no more questions or comments, again, I wanna thank you all so much for taking the time to be here today to um, be present and to partake in our uh, PD economics of globalization. I hope that you walked away with some new approaches and tools on how to teach globalization in your classrooms. Um, we're in the business of helping teachers and um, feel free again to reach out if you have additional questions that may come up after this PD. So thank you again, everybody so much. Have a great rest of your evening. <laughs>